Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. What's going on, everybody? And thanks for listening to another episode of the Wildlife Outdoors podcast. Today is going to be just a snapshot. So we're going to be covering the Aurora Borealis and a little bit of photography. We're going to be doing a uh, kind of a species spotlight in reference mainly to the Guadalupe bass. And then just in general uh, podcast updates and such. So uh, yeah, should be should be a good one. But before we get started, you know, how, how are things going with you, Russell? Man, they're going. Um, just kind of going through the motions like I normally do. Uh, working. We had, you know, a tornado come through town uh, last week. So just been super inundated with work, trying to, you know, get stuff going with that. But it's basically it, man. What about you? Dude, well, I'm glad you're okay, man. And hopefully, you know, the residents of Arkansas are doing okay as well. That's that's crazy, bro. Because you, you said that you were telling me that you could actually hear the tornado and kind of see it from where you're at, right? Yeah, dude, it was nuts. So it actually hit the end of my road, um, which is about a mile back. Uh, but I woke up to the phone giving me the tornado warning or watch or whatever it was. And uh, I was like, I looked over, it was like, you know, maybe 11 o'clock at night, le- like 1130. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, crap. I was like, I didn't know we were supposed to be getting severe weather like that. And so I just put the phone back down, went back to sleep. And then I started hearing the sirens, the whir- across the lake and i was like oh crap and so i get up and i look outside and we have some mimosa trees right outside and they're blowing completely sideways and then i just start hearing like it sounds like twigs breaking but in the morning i found that it was actually full-size trees in the distance breaking um i mean there's trees that are you know big around than i am that just completely snapped there's parts of town that are completely unrecognizable um but yeah i get i get heard in the distance and of course the sirens then you know the wind i could feel the window whenever i went to look out the window the window was just vibrating it was it was insane the amount of sheer pressure was forced was caused by that that dude thing, that's so. terrifying uh, <clears throat> do you know what's what uh what category it was like an e i think it was i think it was a high ef2 yeah dude that's right <clears throat> yeah that's scary it was insane yeah I've, I've been through a few tornadoes but um that one this one was small it was smaller than some of the other ones that i've been through but it was at night and i couldn't really see anything and i could just hear it um yeah dude, it was it was crazy because it was it was night it was dark and i could just hear it and i didn't know how far it was and then when i looked up the radar like it looked like it was right where i was and so it was kind of it was kind of sketchy but it, it wasn't horrible i mean i've been through bigger ones um that were far more scary but it's it's also interesting like there's just something about weather that is fascinating to me yeah dude it really is and tornadoes in particular they're like they're beautiful like i love watching videos of them but they're Mm -hmm. freaking terrifying man it's crazy yeah just the amount of sheer strength they have is is insane yeah it's wild bro but i'm glad you're okay and you know me too um, yeah hopefully folks of arkansas are doing okay too that's crazy yeah, there, with it being an EF2, luckily there wasn't much structural damage, just a lot of trees. Um, a lot of the structural damage was caused by trees. Um, you know, there's a few roofs that are missing and a few <clears throat> buildings that are completely demolished, um, but not a lot of them, just just some here and there. Um, some trailer homes were flipped over, uh, so that one was kind of scary. There's a neighborhood probably maybe 10, 15 minutes away from me where there was a few trailer homes that were completely flipped upside down. and um, So that that's, you know, I can only imagine what it feels like if, if you were one of those residents. But uh, yeah, for the main part, it's mainly just a lot of damage caused by trees. So um, I don't think there was any deaths here in Hot Springs. I think over the weekend, there was a death total of three total in the U.S. from the tornadoes. And uh, the ones in Oklahoma and stuff were bigger than this one. So, Well, prayers to the communities affected by these storms because it was pretty gnarly. Pretty yeah. gnarly. Did y'all get any storms down there? Um, we did. When was it? Thursday, I think. Thursday, my buddy Matt, actually Matt and I, we went to go watch uh, Planet of the Apes. And while we were there, there was a huge storm system moving through the hill country. I think in parts of Mason and Lano, there was like baseball sized hail being dropped on places. Oh, I wow. don't, I, I want to say there was a tornado that had touched down 
near San Marcos. I don't know how big it was. And, uh, but yeah, man, some, uh, some crazy storms from the system. It was pretty wild, but thankfully, uh, at least like here in Kyle, there's just some small, small hill, nothing too, too wild, but yeah, dude, it was pretty intense there for a little bit. And that's crazy. Y'all didn't lose power at the movie theater or anything. Surprisingly. No, I thought we would for sure, but we didn't. And Planet of the Apes also, by the way, if anybody's like into this type of movies, really good. <laughs> Dude, I haven't seen Planet of the Apes. Like I've seen the original one and that's it. Like it came out, what, 70s, 80s? I don't even remember, man. Yeah, but I haven't seen any of the newer ones. Same thing with Star Wars. I've never been a Star Wars fan. I just, I don't know. It just never really appealed to me. But I have seen some of the newer ones, which is kind of weird because being a Star Wars fan, like I had no idea who anybody was. Mm-hmm. Or what was going on, like nothing. But there was entertaining to say, you know, it was entertaining. I enjoyed it, but yeah, it's just I just never really got into it. Star Trek either. But, yep, same. Yeah. A lot of that sci-fi stuff I'm not really into. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I say I'm not into, sci- into sci-fi, but obviously, Planet of the Apes would fall under sci-fi, and I enjoyed that. So <laughs> I'm not really sure where, like, what the line is for me. You know, I don't, I have no idea, but I enjoyed yeah. it. It was good. Well, but, I might uh, have to actually watch that one. Should dude, you should. There's actually a there's going to be a bunch of good movies this summer. Should be a good a good a good summer for movies. But anyways, yeah. Before we get too off topic, <laughs> so uh, I think you had asked how I was doing. Yeah, I'm, I know I'm doing good. Um, I guess we'll do some of the general podcast updates now. So I've been getting ready to go out of town temporarily. I'm not sure how long. It could be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Um, so if you, anybody's been listening before, I'm making a transition in my life, um, specifically like my career and things. Well, I say career, I don't even have a career right now. I'm, I'm a, I'm a grad student, t- uh, technically speaking, but I'm having to take a step back. And, uh, and so I've been in the job market for a while and actually I had a friend reach out to me and he's like, Hey dude, um, actually we, we met up for lunch and we were just kind of catching up me, him and uh, another friend of ours. We were in the same cohort. We all started grad school together. And so we just kind of like hang out, you know, from time to time when we can. And, um, so we met up for lunch one day and he was like, Hey dude, like I actually know somebody <clears throat> who's looking for help this summer to like doing some, um, some research out in the, on the East coast and I could reach out to them, see if you, you know, if, if they'd be willing to have you on or whatever. And I was like, yeah, man, you know, at this point, like I have zero prospects, I'll take anything. So, uh, we talked about it. Um, he gave me their contact information. I sent out the resume and all that stuff. And so, um, ultimately they offered me a spot on their crew. And so the first site that we're going to be going to is in South Carolina. I'll be going out there working for a little bit. And, um, they said that particular contract would be like two weeks, three weeks, depending on weather. And then from there, they just kind of, you know, they'll just have me go wherever they said there's possibilities. I may wind up in Virginia or Missouri. Um, just kind of depends. They'll just kind of send me where they need me, I guess. So that was my general understanding. So I, I was actually supposed to be there. The plan was supposed to, I was supposed to leave Sunday evening or Sunday afternoon and then um, be there by today. And we would start record, uh, start our data stuff. But there's been some, I guess, um, there's been some some issues with some of the paperwork and things that they're having to deal with. And so we had to put a pause on that. So now they're saying there's going to be a departure date of maybe Thursday or Friday. So I'll be leaving out there probably Thursday or Friday. And um, nice. I'll be out there for, for a little bit. So if... I am not on any of the future podcasts for the coming weeks. That's probably why um, I'll be doing a lot of um, nighttime research. So by the, the normal times that we would be having our, our uh, podcast recordings, I will likely be in the field. So it just kind of depends. And um, the only chance that I will have to actually be doing like recordings is if weather um, doesn't allow for us to go to the field. So, it just kind of depends, man. But, um, but yeah, so that's kind of the, my thing right now. So I've just been trying to get ready for that trip, uh, making sure I have all the equipment that I need, uh, make sure I have like my trucks in good shape to make the drive, all that stuff, and uh, just running some little errands, some odds and ends and things, prepping for that trip. And, uh, yeah, man, so we'll see. I'm excited. I'm going to a part of the country I've never been to, to do stuff I've never done. So it'll be, a, it'll be a good time, I think. It'll be different, but... 
That's awesome. That's exciting too. It's it's something new, yeah. something different, yeah. kind of changes up the monotony that you've been dealing with for the past however many years in school. For sure, for <laughs> sure. And, and I should also note this is a temporary deal. Like they're just doing a, uh, like a, I think it's three months. I think it ends in August where they stop doing their data collection. So it is a temporary thing. I'm still applying for more permanent positions and stuff like that. I'm, I'm hoping to hear back from some that I've applied to recently. And that'll kind of determine, I guess, I guess depending how those long-term deals work out, that'll determine how long I, I guess, stay on this crew. You know, if right. you know everything works out and uh, things go how I'm hoping they, they, they will, um, then I will have to kind of leave that temporary gig early so I can, you know, make the, the transition to that other job. But, you know, we'll see, man. So there's a lot of stuff in the works. I'm hoping, I'm hoping things will work out. But in the meantime, you know, it's just uh, trying to get by, I guess. But some good stuff, cool stuff happening. That's awesome. Are you going to try to do some fishing over there? Oh, yeah. I'm packing a fly rod, uh, packing my flies, reels, everything. Going to take my wading boots. Um, there's actually, I was looking on the map earlier, so where we're going to be staying in South Carolina, there's, a, I think, a state park or something nearby. So they got, like, lakes and creeks and things. So I might go uh, whenever. And, and the thing is, like, this job, like, you work – all the time there's no days off the only days off you have is when weather's bad uh, that being mm-hmm. said there may be some some time like in the mornings or something before you, we go to the field there may be there may be some downtime to you know so that you can like do your laundry or go to town to do you know get groceries whatever the case may be so during that time i might try and hit the creek or the little lake or whatever um for an hour or two and just you know i I can't go to a different place and not at least try to go fishing so we'll see what happens right well i hope you can get on something over there is it inland or is it close is it close to the coast at all no it's inland it's in okay it's near it's it's near uh i can't remember what mountain range i don't know if it's the appalachians or smokies but it's near like it's near near a little mountain range so it's inland for sure Dude, so it should be pretty awesome. should be pretty country. I looked at the weather, it's gonna be nice. It's gonna be like down in the fifties at nights at certain nights and highs of like the seventies or eighties. So I get to escape the Texas heat a little bit. So looking forward to that too. But it'll be cool, man. Dude, that's awesome. Well, I hope you uh you get to enjoy yourself, uh not only in the nature of work, but also out there doing some fishing, seeing some stuff that you've never seen and hopefully get on some species that you've never caught. So <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it, man. But yeah, dude, so that's what's up. That's what I've been up to. And uh, and I guess the other thing that I've been up to is you hit me up last week <laughs> about some uh, some northern lights that we didn't – I mean, I didn't think I'd be able to see ever. But that was pretty dope, dude. You want to you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, dude, it was freaking awesome. And so my – it was either my sister or my stepmom that sent me um, – uh, thing on, I think maybe on Instagram or something, uh, or maybe as a text message saying something about Northern Lights uh, might be able to be seen in the South. And I've seen that before. There's been a post before, you know, previous years that I've seen, oh, well, you might be able to see the Northern Lights in the South and go outside and I don't see anything. And um, I was just kind of discouraged after I've seen it a few times. And this time I walked outside and the sky was just pink. And I was like, wait, was that this weekend? And so I get online and I start looking it up and I was like, holy crap, that is this weekend. So apparently a few days before there was some major solar storms. And for those of y'all that don't know, so Aurora Borealis is the Northern lights. They're the lights that can be seen in the Northern hemisphere. Basically they're caused by energized particles leaving the sun from solar storms and solar winds that penetrate the upper atmosphere of earth. And when that happens, those energized particles have to, you know, release heat, release light and stuff like that as they get pulled towards the poles of the earth and that's what causes the streaks and the colors and depending on the chemical composition of what part of the atmosphere they're in is where you get the different colors and so i think hydrogen is like green and nitrogen is red or something like that there's some depending on the chemical composition of that area um is it depends on what color the the lights will be in themselves and so uh here in arkansas we had a lot of pinks a lot of reds and a little bit of green And, um, so I saw the pink and I was like, oh, that's freaking awesome. And so I pulled out my, I ran inside real quick. I was just outside in, you know, shorts. I was in bed 
um, whenever I decided to go out there and, and take pictures of it. So I was like, you know, I wonder, cause I've never tried to take pictures of, of the Northern Lights before. So I'm laying in bed. I was like, I wonder if I can get some good pictures. And so I just hop up, grab my camera and tripod and run outside. And, uh, I just set it up and I was taking eight second exposures and just letting it do its thing. And then I started looking at the pictures on my camera and I was like, Oh, these are so freaking cool. It was awesome, dude. That's sick, dude. Yeah, I remember you had called me. You're like, bro, bro, can you see the Northern Lights? And I was like, dude, what are you talking about, man? We're in Texas. There ain't no way. And he goes, no, dude. And you tell me the whole thing about the soil storm. I'm like, bro, I'm looking at them right now. You should go out there and look. So I walk outside. I'm looking. I was like, dude, I don't see Jack, man. I just see black. And he goes, you might you might need your camera. If you have your camera, go get it and set it, and set it up. So I went inside, grabbed my camera, grabbed my tripod. And I could faintly see like this streaking in the sky i thought they were clouds and then there were there were clouds that night and some of it was but there was but there was a part of that was a, the the northern lights that were all borealis so i set my my track because you told me to look in the south so i looked in the south and i i didn't see really anything and then i started just kind of playing with the with the angles and the the the, the cardinal directions and seeing where exactly i could find it and then i know that's when i noticed that streaking so I just put the, the lens facing that just to see what happens. And sure enough, it was that. So I started like focusing in on that. And it was pretty cool, man. We didn't get the colors that you were getting in Arkansas or any other parts of the country. It was mostly like a, like a pinkish hue. But, dude, it was awesome, bro. It was really, really cool. I didn't ever think I would see the northern lights, especially in Texas, like literally in my backyard. So that was, that yeah. was actually that was pretty dope. Uh, I still want to go see them like in Alaska or Sweden, you know, um, Greenland or yeah. something like that. But just to be able to go outside and, and see it was pretty neat. And then my brother was there. So he was like looking at it through the, through the, um, through the screen. My mom came outside. She's like, Oh man, that's so cool. And it was kind of funny because we have a friend, a mutual friend, uh, Matt. And I texted him. I was like, bro, the Northern lights are, are, are here in Texas. And I sent him the pictures that I took. And uh, he's like, is this right now? I was like, yeah, dude, you could see them. But I didn't say that you could. See, you needed a, a camera to see them, right? I just said, yeah, bro, you could see them. <laughs> so he, so I, that was that was it. Never heard from him again, right? And so it was like I think eleven thirty or so at night. And so the next morning he calls me. He goes, dude, could you really see the northern lights last night? I was like, yeah, dude, it was it was sick. I was like, but you you kind of needed a camera to see it. You couldn't really see it with your with your naked eyes here in Texas. He goes, dude, you jack wagon. He goes, I saw the text message you sent me. So I was like, dude, that's awesome. So I go outside, I'm looking at the sky, and I'm like, man, I don't see nothing. This guy made me get out of bed for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it, I, was, I felt so bad, but it was hilarious. Like, bro, that's my bad. I should have told you. <laughs> and, um, but it was pretty sick, man. I, it was, it was really cool to see that. It Dude, was it was dope. for sure. And, and I've seen them before up in Alaska. Uh, the ones that I saw, they were, oh, I want to say it was in January of probably like 2000. 10 or something like that somewhere in that range but they were all green and you could see them a little bit brighter than we could see the pink ones here um but i would have never guessed that i would be standing outside 80 degrees at 10 o'clock at night looking at the northern lights in the south like would have never guessed they would have come this far south but uh dude it was it was freaking awesome and the thing that sucked though is i was just outside of my apartment so there's so much light pollution i live right off central avenue in hot springs and then we got the big spotlights on the side of the apartments and so if you look at the pictures that i posted like you'll see that the trees are super green and bright that's just from the light pollution coming from the building and it kind of sucked because i wanted the separation of the foreground and, and the background and i wanted to be focused on the aurora with like a black foreground which would have been cool but i just couldn't find an area that was dark enough and so i was walking around the apartment complex trying to find spots and then i was like all right well we should be able to see him again tomorrow so the next night i was like all right i plan on going and i'm going to drive out to the lake like drive an hour away or maybe out to mount ida where it's dark and i was thinking of all these different situations that i could go and find a dark sky and um uh, and then I walk outside at like nine thirty, ten o'clock um, on. I want to say that was Saturday night, and uh, dude, it's just cloud cover. Couldn't see anything. I said, "Damn, I'm not going to drive an hour away to try to you know get a picture of these when it's cloudy like that." So I know my my friend. She she had uh, she messaged me on Instagram because I posted some of the shots. She goes, "Dude, that's so cool. Are you going to go anywhere else and get some photos?" I was like, "Man." I'd, I'd like to. So I started thinking, I was like, dude, I could drive to Johnson City, go to the Perdinalis and, 
get some shots out there. I was like, that'd be pretty dope. Or I can go to Kyle, like where I, where my hometown is, and I can get a shot of the, it would be cool to get a shot of the water tower, the Kyle water tower with the Aurora going past it. Like That'd be pretty cool too. With a 360 bridge in Austin. But then like that day, during the day, it was just insanely cloudy. And I was like, well, I don't want to do all this driving if I'm not even going to be able to see the, see the light. So I kind of waited till nighttime. I was like, if I can see the stars, I'll go. And if not, then I'll just call it a wash, you know? And of course my luck, it was in the, in the luck of many central Texans, unfortunately, like the night that was supposed to be really, really showing, it was just clouds, man. You couldn't even see a star in the sky. It sucked. And, uh, I was like, well, that sucks, but I'm not driving an hour, two hours or however long it is to get some, get some photos. So, right. But it was, it was regardless. I'm glad that I got some photos and I wouldn't have been able to, if you hadn't called me, cause I didn't even know what was going on. So thank you. But, um, yeah, dude, regardless, it was just really cool to see, man. It was, it was pretty awesome. I just hope to be able to see him with my own, my, with my own eyes one day, but right. we'll see. See, I was hoping to find some type of windmill or something like that around here. Cause I feel like just having the silhouette of something in the foreground would have been awesome if you could have, you know, the yeah. lights behind it. But I, I couldn't find anything. And then even when I went outside that second night, I could barely even see the moon. I could see like a little illumination of the moon behind the clouds. And I was like, yeah, mm. it's way too cloudy. I ain't going to be able to see him, which sucked. But that first night yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, dude. And I saw some photos coming from uh, from Big Bend. And that looked awesome. Dude, yeah. And like, the Buffalo National River. There were some cool ones still, taken there also. I still haven't seen those. I need, I need to look, Google those. But yeah, dude, that's pretty bad. That's pretty sweet, man. So I don't know. Hopefully, if I don't know if this will ever happen again or when it does, but definitely going to try and and uh, take some more interesting compositions. But dude, it was, it was just it was it was a for me. I don't even remember when I was a kid ever experiencing anything like this. So once in a lifetime thing for me. So that was pretty yeah. sweet. Well, if you ever want to see them and you want a really good shot of seeing them, I think the uh, best areas to go if you're ever going to travel for them is within a 1500 mile radius of either pole. So there is the Southern Lights too. It's the Aurora Australis, I believe it's called. And so if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, if, if you're within 1500 mile radius of either pole, um, you should be able to see them uh, most nights. So, uh, of course, well, it, it all that. depends on. Yeah. Yeah, so it of course it depends on on solar activity. So the more solar storms, solar flares that you have, um, the the higher intensity that they're going to be. And this one, so the the solar storm that's going on currently, or that was going on last week, the sunspots were so big that if you were using your um, eclipse glasses, you could actually see the sunspots with your naked eye because it was two separate sunspots that had merged and caused a major solar flare to come off of it. And so it was quite the event. I don't think it's going to happen like that anytime soon again. Um, but yeah, you can see them, you know, most days. And of course, you know, when you're the further closest you get to the, to the poles, um, in the summertime, you're going to have more light. So, uh, typically the winter time or, um, you know, close enough to the winter time, at night, you're going to have the best chance to see them. So I know like February and March is really good in Alaska to see them. That's pretty sweet, man. So maybe you can make a trip somewhere, you know, overseas or further up north to see them, you know, in their full glory someday. Cause I don't know if it's going to happen in the South again in our <laughs> lifetime. <at least. laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping, you know, God willing, if uh, I get in a place in life that will allow me to do more traveling, I'm, de I'm definitely going to try and go and, and, Right. See them, see them for sure. But, Dude, I'd love right. to go to a Scandinavian country and, and see them Dude. in the snow, like seeing the reflection. Could you imagine the, the longest boat photography you can get with Northern Lights and snow <sighs> and reflections did, did, and stuff? Did you ever see, I think John B, he, he did a, a European trip. I can't remember if it was Sweden or Greenland or somewhere, but he rented like a, uh, it was like a hut in a tree and he went out one night and there's like, you see the Northern Lights and everything. Dude, it looked awesome i think it was sweden if i'm not mistaken but it was pretty yeah, i haven't seen that i'll have to look that up it was years i mean i'm pretty sure it was him it could have been someone else but i'm pretty sure it's him this was years back a couple years back that was a pretty That's cool awesome. video you should check it out i'll have to look it up for sure well all right man shall we were getting close on time shall we do the little species highlight really quick yeah let's do that all right so this we're doing this because as of may 10th may 10th of this year uh, 2024. It marked 35 years since the Guadalupe bass was officially recognized as a state fish of Texas. And how that came about is kind of interesting. 
The, the Guadalupe bass became the state fish of Texas thanks to Mrs. Shirley Watson and her third grade class out of Decatur, Texas. They thought that there was no, since there was no state fish of Texas, the Guadalupe bass being the only bass native to Texas would be quite fitting for the position. So they actually testified uh, against lawmakers or rather in front of lawmakers to kind of make this happen. And sure enough, they agreed. And so it was, it, it became that the, the Guadalupe bass was our state fish of Texas. 35 years. Now, the Guadalupe bass, I did a little bit of research, so um, bear with me as I kind of go through these little talking points, but <laughs> because it's quite interesting. So the Guadalupe bass was first described by French botanist. I don't even know how I'm going to, I don't even know how to pronounce so I'm just going to guess. Augusta Trecule and his colleagues. They were going from where the Guadalupe, uh, Guadalupe River dumps out on the coast and going up and recording. They were, they were more focused on edible plants. And they just kind of, I guess, happened upon, I don't know if they were fishing or what, they didn't kind of go into detail, but they happened upon this, this bass. And they kind of, they just described it, as, well, I don't know if it was them, but they, they noticed this, this, this particular fish and they were the first to describe it. Later on in 1870, the Guadalupe bass was described as a species, species of largemouth. Many years later, it was reclassified as a species species of spotted bass. And then, in the 1950s, Dr. Clark Hubbs of the University of Texas found both spotted bass and Guadalupe bass inhabiting a, a single stream together, cohabiting. And so, it was through this work and the work of him and his colleagues that they recognized the guas, or rather it led to the guas being recognized as his own individual species, which is pretty cool. And uh, unfortunately, however, through stalking of smallmouth bass, Texas back in like the 19, I can't remember, 1950s, 1970s, I'm not too sure. But in the early, like or the mid 1900s, Parks and Wildlife decided to try and stalk some, or I don't know if it was Parks and Wildlife, but there was some stalking of smallmouth bass in order to try and um, create some more uh, sporting opportunities for fishermen and such, and some of the local streams, rivers. Much of this was was uh, happened to be inhabited by the Guadalupe bass, and it was not out of intention, or rather, they didn't know what the what the I guess repercussions would be of these stockings. But these stockings nearly led to the demise of the of the species as a whole. And through the research by uh, TPWD biologist Gary Garrett. And his colleagues, they found that crossbreeding of smallmouth could also lead to the disappearance of the guad. So, in 1991, TPWD wrote a conservation plan. And to date, they have restored and conserved fishable populations in 14 central Texas rivers. They have stocked over 2.4 million fingerlings. They have implemented nearly 50 habitat restoration or preservation projects, and watershed scale management of riparian invasive plants in eight watersheds. And so, through their efforts, not only has the Golubi bass rebounded in many of these rivers, but they have been flourishing in many of these rivers. And that is kind of a quick little synopsis of our state fish. Dude, that's awesome. I freaking love the Guadalupe bass. It's such a pretty fish. They're fun to catch. They have a little bit more spunk in them than a spot or a, a largemouth. Um, but I didn't know a lot of those details about them. I knew that, you know, at one point they were basically going um, extinct, but I didn't realize that they had done so mm -hmm. much work in order to bring them back. Yeah, dude, it's pretty awesome. And forgive me if I got some of the details wrong. I, I just did a quick little research thing over like, I don't know, 30 minutes or something today. So some of those could be fudge. I'm sure there's some more important details that I may have missed, but that's kind of like just a general general outline. But yeah, man, guas are super awesome. If I'm not mistaken, the first guad that I ever caught, that I that I knowingly caught, um, that being that meaning like I caught a bass and I knew what it was. It's possible that I caught one earlier in my life and didn't know what it was and just kind of lumped it in with a largemouth. Um, but the first Guadalupe bass that I knowingly caught was out of Brushy Creek on the fly, Same. actually, using a, I believe it was a BC streamer. Nice. Yeah. The first guad that I ever caught that I knew was a guad was also on Brushy. <clears throat> oh, good old Brushy, dude. Yep. Love me some Brushy. Well, hell, last time we fished Brushy, I caught 
two, three quads. Didn't catch any Rios, unfortunately. That's what we were going for, but I caught a couple quads. Out, out of that same hole, right? You're just there with, I think it was a real getter, too, you were using. Yep. Yep. Yeah, a real getter, and then you tied up. There was another fly that you tied up for me that um, I've had in my box for years. It may have been a bandito. I don't remember what it was, but uh, yeah, you tied up a couple of different flies, and, and I was basically using all your flies because they're prettier than mine. And uh, <laughs> yeah, caught a couple quads out there on brushy and, and a bunch of long ears and red breasts and stuff. So, but yeah, dude, I freaking yeah, love catching quads. Same, bro. I, I I love quads. I love the patterns. They're so beautiful, man. Of course, the rivers that are in the streams that they live in are just beautiful too. Those yep. and Rio Grande cichlids are probably my favorite fish in Texas. Not only because of the beauty, but also you can't go anywhere else and catch them. You know, it's it's it's, right. it's a kind of a, a point of pride, you know, to have these fish you can only catch in Texas. And I think it's pretty awesome that they're doing so much to try and preserve those species. It's pretty. I pretty agree. Sweet. They're doing similar things yeah. up here in Arkansas with smallmouth. So it's it's a slightly different situation because there's subspecies of smallmouth here. Um, I think it's the Neosho bass and the Ozark bass maybe or the Washita. Uh, but there's different subspecies of smallmouth that are um, interbreeding with northern smallmouth. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think there's a push to try to get them as their own species, kind of like they did with Guadalupe bass. And uh, maybe that'll change some stuff. But yeah, they're doing the stockings they do in the state are with northern smallmouth, and they're starting to infiltrate into the the you know native populations of the Neosho and stuff like that. So um, I hope that something happens with that. And I I've heard that they're pushing for it. I don't know if anything's going to come of it, but yeah, kind of similar situation going on here, unfortunately. Damn man, yeah, it's kind of crazy, man. With there's so much going on. I mean. People are throwing fish, and, and they're, they're, people are altering the landscapes and, and these uh, mm -hmm. watersheds so much. Not only that, but like changes in in, in rainfall and temperatures and all that. Just it, it has such a huge impact on these fish. It's crazy. It does. But, uh, yeah. So yes, I don't know, man. It, the only thing we can do is try and protect them. We can only do what we can. So it's exactly. cool that people. It's just cool that people are going out of the way to try and do that. Do what they can for these animals. But I agree. Pretty awesome. The crazy, awesome. the crazy thing is a lot of stuff is, is happening, um, whether it be for money for the state or for sporting opportunities, like all these changes are being made by humans and it's not being done maliciously, but unfortunately it's normally something bad that happens that makes them notice that what they're doing is harming the ecosystem. And so, um, hopefully in a lot of cases, that's not too late. Um, but only time will tell. Only time will tell. But yeah, man. So, quick little fun fact and happy anniversary to our state fish of Texas. <laughs> yep, <laughs> makes me need a makes me want to head down to Texas and catch one or I some. Mean, you should, you should. <laughs> I should. I need to. I need to make another trip. I know a river that has a ton of them, and we can, we can, we can go. I think Marco, Danny, and I floated this river, and we caught not just guads, but a a mix of species. I think between the three of us, we probably had over two hundred fish that day. It was insane. Oh, wow. It was insane, bro. That is insane. Awesome. I think I know what body of water you're talking about. And so, yeah, after this episode, we need to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, Dude, man. But I think awesome. we're, we're, I think we're about on, well, I think we're, we're at time pretty much. So, if you made it this far, thank you all. Hopefully, uh, you learned some stuff today about our state fish and maybe a little bit about the Aurora Borealis as well. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for listening and, uh, we'll catch you next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.